In five years of making laptop videos, I've covered at best two blockbuster product launches, Apple's revolutionary M-Series and AMD's Ryzen Zen launch. Well, today, I think could be a third. You see, with me is the updated Asus Seaflow 13, a gaming tablet that by itself is an excellent device. But what truly catapults it into the stratosphere is AMD's new Ryzen AI Max Plus 395 processor. A stupidly named product, but a breakthrough one nonetheless. Well, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you know what's coming. I value your time, and I'm not going to make you watch this whole video to find out why. Instead, I'm going to tell you right now. This AMD processor is very special. It is a mega powerful APU combining a huge number of powerful Zen 5 CPU cores with a large number of RDNA GPU cores. It delivers stellar single core performance, insane multi-core CPU performance, and its GPU performs like a 100 watt RTX 4060. Now, unlike laptops with a dedicated GPU, this device is smaller. It has substantially less fan noise and its memory is unified. You can assign up to 75% of system memory to the GPU. Now, if you thought that all this performance came at the cost of power efficiency, you'd be dead wrong. This processor is the most power efficient chip we've ever tested outside of Apple's M series. As a whole, we believe that the Flow Z13 is as competitive as our laptop of the year for the last three years, the MacBook Pro 14 with a Pro level processor. It isn't as power efficient, but it is as powerful. And unlike that laptop, you can play the latest AAA games, run Linux, or use it as a tablet. Look, I could mention many other factors like its great display or stunning premium chassis, but let's dive in. We're going to start with a quick run through of what this new Ryzen AI Max Plus 395 processor is. It has a whopping 16 cores and 32 threads, but what makes this processor even more unique is its 40 RDNA 3.5 graphics cores. For comparison, the HX370 in the G16 only has 16 GPU cores. To support all the extra cores, this processor has a very large amount of cache at 80 megabytes. This makes this new AMD APU more similar to Apple's M series of processors versus the regular ones in Windows laptops, which by the way is one of the reasons we keep making this comparison. So how does the Flow Z13 perform? In Geekbench, which tests a variety of common performance tasks, it does very well. It gets over 3000 points in single core, beating out all current gen processors other than the Max. In multi-core, the AI Max Plus smashes Windows competitors by a whopping 5000 points. It even beats out the M4 Pro 12 core. This is super impressive. Now when we move over to Cinebench, which tests the device's performance when maxed out, it is an even better story. In multi-core, it beats out every competitor, often by a huge margin. It even beats out the higher-end MacBook Pro 14 with the M4 Pro 14-core chip. Over a 10-minute continuous Cinebench run, which we do to test thermal throttling, its small size is likely having an effect. The Flow did drop its performance a bit, but it's still a phenomenal performer. Now, one of the reasons that this processor is able to do so well in such a small chassis is its power efficiency. It draws less power than the TUF A14 and the much larger Predator Helios Neo 14, yet, as I showed you, it performs better. When we drill down into our scatter plot, you can see that its power efficiency is way better than any Windows laptop processor. The way this graph works is that you want to see high performance for as little power draw as possible. The four pink dots are for this new device in silent, performance, turbo and manual modes. What you can see is that this processor pulls around the same wattage as the Ryzen 9 HX370 chip in our much larger G16, but performs significantly better. When we compare this processor to Intel's brand new Arrow Lake H, which will be found in similar sized laptops, it is a complete murder scene. Not even remotely close. As usual though, Apple still wins here, but this processor is clearly number two, and number one if you don't want a Mac. Now, this processor does not seem to follow the same diminishing marginal returns as others, meaning if it is placed in a larger laptop with a more robust cooling solution, it will probably do even better. According to AMD, it can be fed up to 120 watts. This also makes us extremely excited for AMD's upcoming fire range of laptop processors with vCache. That one should perform even better. Now, a more efficient chip tends to lead to less heat, fan noise, and better battery life. When it comes to heat you feel, the Flow has an additional advantage. It is a tablet with a detachable keyboard. As the processor is behind the screen, not underneath the keyboard, you feel no heat during intense gaming or coding sessions, and that is just wonderful. 
The tablet's backside, where you may put your hands to adjust its angle, it does get a bit toasty. When it comes to fan noise, it was very reasonable, even on its turbo mode. As I showed you, this laptop beats out every other competing laptop in CPU tasks, yet it is the quietest. In fact, we often advise you to game on the laptop's default balance performance mode for a trade-off of a minimal drop in performance but a big drop in fan noise. You don't have to do that here. You'll also be pleased to know that when you do hear the fans going, they aren't high-pitched or annoying like the Sapphire G16. Let's talk a bit more about manual mode. Now, we did run the fans at max for this mode so that you can see the device's best possible performance. You may be able to dial back the fans without affecting performance. Check this out though. When we compare the Max Plus in the Flow to Intel's 14900HX in the much larger Strixcar 18, this device draws half as much power, has similar fan noise, yet has the same performance. What a phenomenal win for AMD! Now, if you're wondering what this laptop is like in light use, you may hear a little bit of fan noise on its default performance mode. That's if you're in a quiet room. If you do switch to silent mode, it's inaudible. Good news here. Again, unlike most laptops, this one still performs well in silent mode. If you're planning to do performance tasks while unplugged, you won't be able to run the flow on its highest turbo or manual modes. In fact, its performance is heavily throttled. But that's the case on most Windows gaming laptops, and this one, it still has good performance. After running Cinebench on a loop for 30 minutes, the flow drained over half of its battery. Look, running performance tasks while unplugged is really only something a MacBook does well. The Helios Neo 14 and the Sapphire G16 appear competitive with MacBooks, but when you look at their unplugged performance, you get the full picture. In lighter tasks like playing a Netflix movie for 4 hours over Wi-Fi, the flow does pretty well, only draining around 30% of its battery. This is similar to the Tough A14, which has the same resolution display and an AMD Zen 5 processor. When looking at a full battery rundown, the flow lasted around 12 hours. This is the simplest of our battery tests though, as it just plays a downloaded movie on a loop. Let's talk GPU performance. When we look at TimeSpy, a DirectX 12 gaming benchmark, the integrated graphics in this processor is on par with an RTX 4060 in our tough A14. Now we have seen RTX 4060s in laptops perform better, but that's in much larger laptops like the tough F16. This GPU though, it isn't quite as powerful as an RTX 4070. As a representation of what to expect with hidden fan noise while gaming, you can see that the flow remained cool with minimal fan noise on turbo mode. Now, on its highest fan settings on manual mode, it actually had the same fan noise as the tough A14 on its turbo mode, so that's really good. Looking at Port Royal, a ray tracing benchmark, this is one of the few places where the graphics in this new processor just really underwhelm. It is significantly behind an NVIDIA RTX 4060 for this type of processing. When we move over to Wildlife Extreme, which is a cross-platform benchmark and therefore compatible with macOS, the flow is back to doing very well. It performs around the same as the Tough A14 and the MacBook Pro 14 with the higher-end M4 Pro 20-core GPU. Now let's take a look at some actual gaming benchmarks, but before we do that, we want to go over an important configuration. Our flows were all set to a max of 4GB of system memory available to the integrated GPU. For all our GPU testing, we had to up this. You can do this either in Armory Crate or the BIOS. 8GB is recommended by Asus. They did inform us that they do plan to have this set as default in the future. Let's take a look at Cyberpunk. We benchmarked it at 2560 by 1600 ultra settings with ray tracing and DLSS disabled while on turbo mode. The flow got a respectable 52 FPS. This is a little lower than we'd like to see, but this is at max settings. Turn those down and you'll be fine. In Monster Hunter Wilds, we benchmarked it at 2560 by 1600 ultra settings. It gets a score of 13,512 and an average FPS of 40. Look, same deal as Cyberpunk. If you turn the settings down, it's going to be fine. In Forza, we benchmarked it at 2560 by 1600 ultra settings and we were able to get 78 frames per second on average. Now, for real-world gaming, we gamed for several hours on Cyberpunk, Space Marine 2, and Fortnite. We ran all the games at the flow's native resolution of 2560 by 1600 on medium or equivalent settings while on turbo mode. We felt that this is the kind of settings that actual gamers would use. A balance of quality, high enough frame rates, and reasonable fan noise. During this time, we ran CapFrame X to capture the flow's performance. In Cyberpunk, we saw an average of 89 FPS and 1% lows of 54. In Space Marine 2, we saw an average of 40 FPS and 1% lows of 25. Space Marine is a very new and intensive game, so this one you'll probably have to lower the resolution. In Fortnite, we saw an average of 88 FPS and 1% lows of 52. 
During these gaming sessions, there were a couple of things we appreciated. For example, the device blows hot air out the top, so it doesn't blow the hot air on your mouse hand. The tablet form factor was also a big win while gaming. Firstly, there are no heat generating components under the keyboard, so it always felt cool to the touch. Secondly, many gamers, including yours truly, like to use mechanical keyboards. On a normal gaming laptop, you'd have to be docked or push the entire laptop back. On the flow, you just attach the keyboard and replace it with a mechanical one. Sierra also mentioned, by the way, that she would probably just take the keyboard off and use a controller. Now, I'll talk about creative workloads, which like gaming, we tested on turbo mode. For video editing, in Puget's Premiere Pro benchmark, the flow performed around the same as a MacBook Pro 14 with the higher-end M4 Pro 20-core GPU, but behind laptops with an RTX 4060 or above. Taylor did try editing one of our videos and found the experience quite positive, a big upgrade from the integrated GPUs of other Windows laptops. In Puget's DaVinci Resolve benchmark, it did even better. This time on par with competing RTX 4060 laptops and even beating out the Neo 14 with an RTX 4070. Resolve does tend to run very well on AMD processors. Moving on to Puget's Photoshop benchmark, it does fantastically. It beat out all competing laptops with an RTX 4060 and 4070 and came close to the higher end MacBook Pro 14 with the M4 Pro 20 core GPU. We have been informed by a Puget rep that the reason laptops with dedicated GPUs do poorly here is likely due to the way that laptops allocate power between the CPU and GPU. If you feed more power to a dedicated GPU on a laptop, it may come at the expense of power to the CPU. Alright, one of the areas that I was most excited to test was data science and AI. These folks want a powerful GPU and lots of graphics memory. The GPU in this processor can access up to 75% of system memory, and you can get up to 128 gigabytes in the flow. I loaded up DeepSeek R1, and for comparison, I also loaded it on a MacBook Pro 14 and a Zafiris G16 with NVIDIA's RTX 4070. I asked the model to solve the standard wolf, goat, cabbage test. One of those problems where you need to move something across the river, but you can't leave certain things behind. All three laptops were able to quickly complete a simple 7 billion parameter model. They did it in around 3 minutes or less. However, out of the three attempts, only the MacBook Pro was able to solve the problem, and it did it only once. After this, I tried upping the difficulty to a 14 billion parameter model. Now we can see some interesting findings. Both the Flow and the MacBook were able to solve the problem, twice each, although they did take longer to do it. On average, the MacBook was faster. The G16 with NVIDIA's RTX 4070 did not complete a test in under 30 minutes. When I look at VRAM usage, I think I know why. On the Flow, I could see that the model was using 13.5 gigs of VRAM. On the G16, its RTX 4070 is limited to 8, so it likely couldn't keep enough data in VRAM. To confirm this, I loaded up the model on the much bigger SCAR 16 with an RTX 4090 and 16 gig of VRAM. It was able to run the model, no surprises, and it was actually the fastest on average, but its answers were wrong. Anyway, this shows a big advantage to chips like the AI Max in the Flow and Apple's M series where their GPUs can have access to lots of memory. All right, testing out of the way, let's talk about the rest of the device. Everyone here unanimously felt that the Flow Z13 looks really special. The metal chassis has this premium aesthetic with a fusion of industrial design cues. There is this really cool window at the back where you can see the motherboard lit up by customizable RGB. When it comes to the size and weight, look, I don't want anyone to be surprised here. This is a thick and heavy gaming tablet. It weighs a little more than a MacBook Pro 14, but it is very well built. This extends to the tablet's kickstand, which is sturdy. It can be adjusted to a wide variety of positions, even close to 90 degrees. You'll definitely be able to set it at the right angle for you. Once you finish using the tablet, the keyboard becomes the cover, just like on most of these devices. Looking around it, the power button is on the right side of the screen, but it is recessed so you won't accidentally mispress it. The volume up and down rocker and the command set of buttons though are not. In addition to the buttons, there is a USB-A port on the right side lower down. On the left side, you get two USB-C 4.0 ports that support power delivery and up to 100 watts of charging. You get an HDMI port and Asus's proprietary charging port. This device does come with a 200 watt charger, so you won't be able to get its full performance using just USB-C charging, at least not until these kind of devices come with Thunderbolt 5. Other than this, you get a microSD card reader. Look, it has a good variety of ports, but we were disappointed with their placement. Firstly, all three charging capable ports are on the left side. It means you'll have to run a cable around the back if you're plugging into something that is on the other side, which is just inconvenient. Secondly, many ports are far up the tablet, it could cause cable strain, and it just looks messy. 
When it comes to the display, I switched to this device straight after reviewing the ThinkPad T14s. Boy was I shocked at how much better this IPS panel is. It is very bright at 560 nits, it has a fast refresh rate 180 hertz, and a wide color gamut. Its resolution of 2560 by 1600 spread across its 13.4 inch panel is perfect. It gives it a very high PPI of 225. So even small text for coders or Excel warriors looks nice and crisp. It is a touchscreen with pen support, which just really makes this device very versatile. Students, artists, and the like, you guys are going to love it. We didn't detect any PWM flickering when raising or lowering the brightness, which is good. Backlight bleed on our production unit was very minimal. Our only minor issue is that its panel is glossy. This does make the content look nice and vibrant, but in a very bright environment, you'll probably notice some reflections. The keyboard is very good for a tablet. It has 1.7 millimeters of key travel, the keyboard deck is very sturdy, and it just feels delightful to type on and look at. That's because its keyboard is of course RGB lit. The trackpad is okay. It is a mechanical one and tracking is accurate enough, but its click is loud and it does require some pressure. I would have loved to see it come with a haptic one. The speakers are pretty decent. The sound they produce is pleasing, but they don't get loud and they completely lack bass. Take a listen. Here's how the 1440 webcam on the flow looks and sounds. Honestly, not great. Colors are way off and it does look a little grainy. The SSD in the laptop is upgradable, easily in fact, by panel on the back. The memory though is soldered, but it is faster. To test Linux, we booted up Fedora 41 from a USB key. It was a mostly positive story. Wi-Fi, brightness up and down, and trackpad, webcam, all of them worked. The only thing that didn't was Bluetooth and the speakers. Hopefully with a full install and update they will, but they didn't out of the box. Alrighty, let's wrap. The model that we tested with 32 gig of memory and one terabyte of storage has a starting price of $2,300 here in the USA. Now there is a cheaper model with a worse processor and more expensive models with more memory, up to a whopping 128 gigabytes. Overall, we feel the pricing is reasonable for what you get. As we showed you, this device gives you the performance of a high-end M4 Pro 14-core CPU and an NVIDIA RTX 4060 GPU. A great combination, especially since its power efficiency allows it to be placed in such a small device. Sure, if you're purely gaming, you can find a more powerful gaming laptop for the money, but no laptop is as do-it-all as this device. You can play the latest games on it, you can use it as a tablet, you can edit videos or photos on it, you can code on it, or you can do data science work. It's compact and portable, yet it is still very premium. Look, we've had four reviewers spend weeks testing our Flow Z13s, and every single one of us stood up and said, hey, this is a really special device, and I could see myself actually buying one. And folks, that has never happened before. The only major issue with a Flow C13 is whether a tablet is right for you. Tablets, they don't work great on your lap. If you want to buy the Flow Z13, we will link all the configurations available below this video. If you want to know which laptop that we recommend for your specific use case, head on over to our website at justjosh.tech. You'll find tailored recommendations over there. We also link to the retailer currently offering the best deal. And we even have a helpful price tracker so that you can know if it's a good time to buy. It's quickly becoming a hub for laptop buying, so go check it out. I'm going to end by saying the following. If you are a manufacturer watching this video and you don't have a laptop coming out with this Max Plus 395 chip, you are an idiot. Till next time, go do something awesome with your day and we will catch you later.